wall. They said this is a red line that cannot be crossed. And by the way, if Russia intervenes militarily in this way, Russia will be the first country from outside the Middle East to send ground forces into the Syrian civil war. Very big development, enormous development, very big development. Now, here's what's even more interesting. Here is what's even more interesting. On August 18th, six of Russia's advanced MiG-31 Foxhound interceptor aircraft landed at the Syrian Air Force's Mezi Air Base, which is the military section of Damascus International Airport. And right after the F Russian fighters landed, they were immediately followed by giant Russian Antonov AN-124 Condor cargo planes carrying 1,000 of Russia's S-9M-133 Cornet anti-tank missiles. A thousand of the most advanced anti-tank missiles that Russia has. Number two, before the Russian jets landed in Damascus, Moscow reached an agreement with Washington, with Washington, for the removal of NATO's Patriot missile batteries from Turkey. Now, why would that be done? <clears throat> why would Moscow insist that Obama remove NATO Patriot missiles in Turkey? Because they were afraid that Turkey could fire the missiles at Russian fighters carrying out operations in Syrian airspace. This is a big, big story, and it's going to develop over the next week. Very big story to put ground troops, jet aircraft, anti-tank missiles to, su to support Assad, who, in my opinion, Obama is trying to overthrow by permitting ISIS to run wild across the Middle East. Now, on the face of it, what's interesting here is that the U.S. is cooperating with Russia by removing the well, encouraging NATO to remove the Patriot missiles, okay? But which side is Washington really on? Is it on the side of ISIS or on the side of Assad? That's the only question there is with regard to this humanitarian nightmare that has emerged because of Obama's meddling and the Arab Spring ignited by none other than Hillary email Clinton. Never forget... Those emails contain info on the Arab Spring, which has blown up the world. This is the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Uh, Tony, I can't hear this anymore. Can you break this? I never want to hear it again. You ask for rock and roll, the same song, like, like an automaton. The same song, over the river and across the sea. I, just break it out of the thing. I never want to hear it again. It's overplayed. Too many times, that's all. So anyway, look, it's Thursday, it's Labor Day weekend. What do you care about Iran, a nuclear bomb? Well, that's it. And what do you care if Israel disappears? Big deal. Just a bunch of greedy Jews. Let them, let them pack their valises and move to Los Angeles, right? What do you care if Obama floods America with Muslim? What do you care if the churches become mosques? I mean, it was done in Turkey, where the great, greatest cathedral in the world became a mosque. So what's the difference? What do you care about anything? What do you care if America becomes like Mexico, a totalitarian, a totalitarian third world banana republic run by narco terrorists? What do you care? What do you care? Just keep driving your car. Hey, look at the new cars out there. Look at the colors of the shirts you can buy. Go on a cruise, too. <laughs> Take a nice cruise as a result of your wonderful work all your life. Throwing away the legacy that you inherited. What do you care about any of it for? Isn't that the new modality of America? Care about nothing? Isn't that the mark of the intelligent man and woman to care about nothing? Is that not the mark of the atheist? There's no God. There's no judgment. Weren't you told for 40 years by the radical lesbian feminists not to be judgmental? Sure. So now that you're not judgmental, they're throwing Christians in jail who won't, won't uh, grant marriage licenses. They're pretty judgmental. You're not supposed to be judgmental, but if the radical lesbian feminists are quite judgmental, aren't they? How'd that happen? How did it happen? Because you don't see things for what they are. It's called sleight of hand. The problem for them is that there's some of us out here, and a lot of us, who can see the sleight of hand, and it's not so slight. So what's the hope? A lot of hope. Yeah, right, a lot of hope. A lot of hope. Now, Trump signs the loyalty oath with Previous, 
that milk toast of the Republican Party, and I don't like it. I don't know what that really means. It seems like a peace treaty between the uh, old line Republican gangsters and Donald saying, look, we won't attack you if you agree that if you're not nominated by our gang, you will not turn against us and run as a third party candidate. As they sort of neutralized each other. It's a little worrisome. It's a, the previous is about the perfect man to be the stooge of Obama. There's no, no two-party system. It's a one-party system. You know, I don't think I want to talk about any of this. I'm not in the mood. I almost rather talk about real estate, cars. I don't know what I'm going to drift off into. I do have a frothy espresso in my hand from one of those little machines. I'm not going to name it. Give me a minute. Hold, hold it. Hmm. Hmm. God, I needed that. I needed that. The only thing missing now is a little piece of lemon, the Italian style, the skin of the lemon. Just, not, But it, if you put lemon in, it kills the taste of the coffee. The way the Italians do it is I'm talking razor-thin piece of lemon. It's perfect. Of course, the lemon had sense because it neutralized the acids in the coffee. You don't know that, but what do you need to know anything for? Well, we could talk about Iran, the corporate winners for the nuclear agreement, Headlines for the Savile, Savile Nation. Savage. <laughs> he went, La Raza backs Jeb. No kidding. He is La Raza. Jeb Bush is the mouthpiece for La Raza. La Raza, the most racist organization in America, in my opinion, which means the race. How could you run an organization called the race and not be considered racist? Well, they slammed Trump for English language promotion. And they, and they backed Jeb uh, Bush. Green energy company fights for life after getting billions from feds. Oh, that's a shock. That's a shock. I don't believe this. I don't believe that a green energy company be run by criminals. There's more money in green energy than there is in smuggling heroin which, with less risk. That's what I read somewhere. There is more money in Obama's alternative energy programs than there is in crime. This is the greatest crime ever foisted on the American people, and it's perfectly legal. This is something that, well, as the Godfather character said in, uh, actually it was the Meyer Lansky character said in Godfather 2, Michael, we're bigger than General Motors. <laughs> you remember that famous scene where they're cutting him a birthday cake? Michael, we're bigger than General Motors. Well, right now, the uh, green companies are bigger than General Motors. And they can't go to jail for robbing, milking, milking the public, it used to be called. Since 2009, Abin Goa and its subsidiaries have received $2.9 billion in grants and loan guarantees through the Department of Criminal Energy to undertake solar projects in the late great state of California and Arizona, the arid zone of Zona, as well as the construction of a cellulosic ethanol plant in Kansas. But in the space of less than a year, Abin Goa's financial health has become critical, leading investors to worry whether the company can survive. Where did the $2.9 million in grants and loan guarantees go to this renewable energy multinational company headquartered in Spain? It's a favorite of Obama. Federal tax money for clean energy. But where did the $3 billion go? Why, the same place that Solyndra's money went. Same place that senators' relationships uh, monies go. Houses, yachts, airplanes. It's the way of the world. It's the way of the world. The most corrupt nation in the world right now is the United States of America. But it's all clean. It's actually, it's so, un it's so corrupt that the corruption has become so legal that it's not even corrupt. The only corruption now is to not be corrupt. I was watching a documentary last night on India and the economy of India. And you may have read this years ago, the elephant that became a tiger, India. Now, we know India was booming. It's a little slow now. But I was fascinated to see how poverty went down and literacy went up in two decades. And how the, the cities of India boomed. And I didn't understand what had happened till I watched this documentary last night. Here's what happened. After the British left India, and I think it was 1947, as a result of the um, nonviolent Mahatma Gandhi, the guy with the diaper and the cane, the wood stick, 
I'm just giving you a caricature. Gandhi, the guy with the diaper and the wood stick. He used uh, nonviolence to drive the British out. So everyone cheered, yay, nonviolence works. Well, one of the first thing that happens was the Muslims rioted, wanted all of India. The Hindus fought back. There was a war. So the peaceful man in, 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 in the diaper made a decision, and he decided to carve out a new nation for the Muslims. And on the march to the Muslim nation, a million people died. Hindu and Muslim killed each other. That's a little side effect of uh, the separation. So then the Muslims got their own nation, and they still weren't, ha weren't happy. Now they're still trying to take India apart. But let's put that aside for a minute, just for a minute. What actually freed the Indian economy? So right after the British leave, what they leave in place, they left a gigantic bureaucracy. The British were great bureaucrats. They were fabulous government workers. They created great government in infrastructure that was a fundamentally socialist infrastructure. And the Indians inherited it. So people said, wow, now that the British are gone, we're going to do something new. Well, guess what happened? The minute Indians took over the roles of the British... They not only didn't get rid of the infrastructure where the government ruled everything, they expanded it. They expanded the socialist infrastructure that the British had left them, and they became even more dictatorial, and things froze. Poverty increased after the British left. Starvation increased after the British left. Disease increased after the British left, because localized government, that was really centralized socialist government, could not manage the country. And then a miracle occurred. Somewhere along the way, uh, I think it was in the 1990s when reforms began, and India abandoned the socialism that they had created in as a copy, a carbon copy, but worse of, uh, of, uh, of, of the British. And once they got rid of socialism, what is socialism? Let's make it simple. Let's say you own a house in America or even an apartment and you want to build something. How many different permits do you have to apply for? That's socialism. Every time you apply for a license or a permit, you're facing a socialist bureaucrat. I live in a various areas around the country. One of them is Marin County. It's perhaps the most impossible place on earth to do anything because the socialist bureaucracy is crippling. To put up a fence, 10 morons have to sign off on it. Ten morons, permits, licenses, idiot morons. So people don't build as much as they would. It cripples growth in every way imaginable. Everyone knows this except the socialists in Marin County, New York City, and, and Washington. So in India, they abandoned the licensing and the permit process in 1991. They got rid of their socialism, and they adopted economic reforms that converted the once lumbering elephant into the Asian tiger that we know it to be. Why? Now, they were warned by this communist socialist then, just as Obama and the phonies warn you now, that India would suffer a lost decade of growth if they got rid of this kind of constrictive socialism. The Indian people were warned that opening up the nation would allow multinationals to crush Indian companies. And fiscal stringency, meaning no more printing of money, no more government programs, would strangle social spending and safety nets, hitting poor people and regions. Does it sound familiar to you? Does it sound just like Hillary Clinton's uh, policies? Well, there you go. But guess what happened? Indian businesses not only held their own, they became multinationals themselves. Booming revenue from fast growth financed a boom that has never been seen in India, India's history. Why? Because the people were free to do as they felt was best to build a business and make a profit. In other words, the free market worked. The absolute opposite of what this fraud doing an Alaskan dance is telling us. Everything this liar-in-chief tells you is, is backwards from the real-world experience. The man is stuck in the doxies of the 1960, 1960s. This is a madman running America. A madman who doesn't even know what world history has taught us. Nothing. So there's your little mini lesson on what socialism is. When you hear the word socialist, you don't know what it means. You, you don't know. Your images come to your mind. I'm a pictographic performer. So when I say socialist to you, think of the bureaucrat in your town or city who you have to go to to put a deck on your house, 
or to put a road sign in front of your house.